That's one of the things that unions do in giving voice to people. They start to see a different way. And so I don't disagree with experiments under capitalism of a different way, because I really do think we need to try experiments. And, and some will work, some won't. But how can we make them learning experiments? And, and to what extent can we make them possible as far as you know, another way of doing things? Because remember, what the right is saying to us right now is you can have 500 types of beer, but only one type of economy, uh, that there is no other way. And what we need to do is show that there are other ways. So I'm too chatty. Hello, oh, so yeah, thanks for the comments. And uh, thank you, Lane, for elaborating uh, these very important points. Uh, I actually thought drum was a huge success. I think it's one of the examples is that. Oh, okay. But I'm just saying that that's an example of very important. Uh, the Dodge Revolutionary uh, Worker uh, Union movement, which uh, uh, workers took over the factory against uh, uh, Dodge Chrysler Corporation, as well as against uh, the wishes of the union. And so, in fact, uh, the union's interest was antithetical to that of the workers because the union, in that context, wanted to show they would be the intermediary between the workers and the union. I actually, and what worked in that context was the fact that the, the very fact that the people who were employed in the factory lived in the community right next door and, uh, and in the entire community, so they had a tremendous amount of support for a period of time. The question is sustaining it, and this is something that, you know, it's part of an interrogation and uh, a learning process that I think, you know, we've been able to sustain various forms of occupations for periods of time. Whether they can be extended into the future is another point. I actually think they could. Uh, another thing is with respect to unions is that not all unions are the same. Uh, you know, I'm not making a blanket statement, but there are a lot of examples to be learned from the autonomous movement uh, that is growing and the operists, uh, not the people that go to the opera, but people who are engaged in uh, workers uh, uh, movements uh, uh, throughout Europe and beyond uh, to, in fact, create new structures where they believe the unions do not actually represent their interests because of the uh, fact that capital has fragmented to such a degree that we now have uh, in this post-Fortis environment uh, hundreds of different types of uh, workers employed in mass production industries. So we're almost back at the beginning of the 20th century again. We're in mass production. We're back to a notion of craft, but only people with different types of skills uh, are not getting paid uh, even wage differentials uh, to their advantage. So we have to think about creating new democratic forms of unionization. And there are examples of unionized organizations, uh, unionized enterprises uh, that are also uh, controlled by workers. I mean, Madison Qua Cab is one example of that. But there are a lot of other examples throughout the United States and around the world. It, it, you can have a union and also have uh, worker control at the same time. I was going to also make a, a, a quick point about the work of Jerry Tucker, um, uh, ran for the pres presidency of the UAW, uh, and was part of a uh, caucus movement, uh, and lost, but he was engaged in a series of uh, what I would argue worker control efforts to try to uh, minimize the types of work uh, and the intensity of work, increase wages, and engage in a number of strategies where actually the workers may not have explicitly taken over the factory, but tacitly they controlled the factories. They, uh, for instance, you know, basically people went uh, to the mail room and found that, you know, maybe you were, uh, the people in the mail room were sick, you know, there was a sick out there. So essentially the entire factory could not operate because they depended on goods coming into that shipping segment. Uh, and, and, and Jerry was very innovative still alive, uh, he's, and continues to think about these issues, uh, about developing new strategic ways in which you could actually challenge capital. Jerry's tactic was ruled uh, also illegal by, by the courts. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. I think we, we are in, living in a time where 
challenging capital is incredibly successful and popular uh, amongst people around the, uh, this country. People don't believe in the uh, ideological, at least, hegemony of capital. I, I think we, we've cracked something in the last four or five years. That's We have a kind of different type of mindset in you know, talking to brothers and sisters around the world, and wherever you go, people are looking at uh, the United States as an example, and um, I think we should try to prefigure those of us who are in unions or outside of unions, or thinking of uh, occupying plants or seeing plants. There was a Taunton, Massachusetts example that could have been occupied, but it was an aerospace, I believe, industry that was, was run by and it could have affected other workers. But if we can uh, pre, you know, prefigure what might take place in the future, uh, that a uh, plant is about to close, I think we have many quite good opportunities and because factories are, and, and service industries are being closed every single day. And it's not just the service sector, it's also the public sector as well. Um, well, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, um, I really especially love the account of the, what happened with the phone workers in British Columbia. It's a great story. Um, I have a couple of comments for your perspective uh, consideration. First of all, because Emerson Electric evidently, from what I understand, have like one of their original locations in the neighborhood where I live in Cambridge, and we've invented the iron lung and had a lot to do with the iron lung. If you could just say a little more about the Emerson story, because I came in just as you were. I, I don't know if there's anything you can say about the Emerson story. Number one. Number two, anything about the recent Verizon strike that has any resonances, if you will, to what your, your account of what took place in British Columbia, or where might it have in some way that might be relevant. And the final thing is, we, uh, we had a little bit of a conversation about this earlier. You said you had some disagreements with Gar Alperovitz, and because people are nice enough to bring copies of Dollars and Cents in the front page feature article by Mr. Alperovitz, if you could say a little bit about how your understanding of some of this landscape, if you will, differs from his. Okay. Um, uh, on your first question with respect to Emerson Electric, uh, when you were walking into the room, I don't recollect precisely when you did. Um, I was talking about the sit-down strike in St. Louis. In what year? Uh, in 1938 and, and so forth. And I'm not really familiar at all with uh, its foundation here in Boston, although I do know that it's a company that's been around for a long time, and it would be a great idea for somebody to do that history and find out exactly um, why uh, you know, Emerson was one of the largest companies in the United States in the 30s, and it remains a large company, as I pointed out earlier. W with respect to a difference that I might have with Gar uh, Aperovitz, um, it has to do with this whole notion of cooperatives. And um, uh, I know some people were talking, you know, kind of, kind of impressed by what's going on in the Cleveland cooperative uh, movement as if it's some kind of earth-shaking event. Now, I think it's great that you're, you have a group of cooperatives funded by the same organizations, more or less, and uh, probably even some capitalist firms that, uh, and financial firms uh, that are producing and developing jobs in the green uh, industry and, and media and so forth. I think that's a good thing. I, I don't think it's the panacea. I don't know whether or not that we should, you know, what, my big question here is, I don't, and I think Gar should be here, I don't think it challenges the capitalist logic, which is really uh, one that we need to do at this point in time. That, yes, it's fine and it's great, it, it seems to be a top-down initiative in Cleveland and many other cases with respect to cooperatives that do-gooders or people who are inclined to uh, saving industry uh, in the United States or other countries, there's a kind of a nationalist uh, potential there, uh, are 
you know, saying, okay, you know, we'll, we'll invest because, you know, we feel like this economy is, you know, doing a very bad job in defending the working class in the United States. And you could conceivably have, you know, high, you know, large state financiers funding these cooperatives. Um, because ultimately they will continue to owe money to some financial firm, whether they are good or, you know, whether they do good things, and most of them do good things or, 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 you know, find good operations. They want a profit. You're working within a capitalist logic in capitalism. And yes, it's a nice thing to have a cooperative. And I've, I think there are many good examples historically and in the contemporary era. I just suggested that it is a good idea uh, in many instances to have cooperatives. But I don't think it's the answer. I, I think if you really want to create a crisis of capitalism, uh, take over a private enterprise or a public enterprise and see what happens. Uh, and that creates this, the, the base. I actually don't agree with uh, the notion that small events don't change things. I think actually uh, it, it focuses on the inequities within a system and it resonates with uh, a lot of other people. Obviously, those people who are engaged in the struggle itself, uh, as in Republic Dorum Window, they certainly will have the most insight into what happens and the dynamics of that process. However, at the same time, you know, when you, I like cooperatives, I like the idea, because they tend to be developed out of, the, you know, by people who have ideas. They tend to be developed by uh, professional activists, as opposed to organic activists. And that's not anything, I'm not saying anything against professional activists, because I think better have professional activists than prof uh, professional financiers, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but on the other hand, if we really want to change things, and I really am looking for that opportunity, we, we do need to have something that goes beyond uh, cooperatives that will compete with private sector enterprises, and ultimately, unfortunately, probably fail. Because under capitalism, business fails. I mean, we all, some of you have read Schumpeter's work, I'm sure most of you perhaps, you know, it, that's part of the process. So when, uh, in Wales, the Welsh uh, colliers uh, took over their factory. They had a very successful example of worker control. They occupied the factory and they got uh, government loans and they got loans from private seg segments of the economy. But ultimately, the coal industry, after 13 years, could not sustain that uh, uh, workforce and they had to shut down. So, you know, within capitalism, ultimately, do we know any any plant that stayed in business for more than you know, 20, 30 years? Baker's chocolate. Okay. <laughs> but there are very few. I know it's a kind of rhetorical question, but I, I don't even know Baker's chocolate, but I think, uh, I, think my, I think I remember it when I was a kid. It's the kind of stuff that you make uh, chocolate Cocoa. cake? Cocoa, okay. All right. Anyway, that's, uh, I hope, uh, and it's not in any way to diminish Gara's important work, uh, Professor Alperovitz's uh, work, uh, because I think it's important and it represents some kind of difference and it's better than starting uh, an enterprise where you have a few people who are controlling it and banks controlling it. But I, in, in cooperatives, you can have banks controlling it. I mean, I know there are examples, for instance, in Argentina and in, in the United so, States as well. If I, if I may, where, do you, where are you drawing a distinction between what you are look to uh, as something that's going to challenge the logic, the profit logic of capitalism, but but may but be competitive and possibly fail. What would how is that how is that what what are, what are the essential elements of that? Um, well first of all I think there are many examples uh, of cases where uh, workers took control over industries and they ultimately uh, succeeded in, in gaining uh, those industries uh, in countries that became socialist um, in the early 20th century. Uh, I also think that uh, in many instances we have to construe the idea of worker control uh, as uh, something in which uh, workers actually control how things are produced and how when they're going to go to work and when they're going to leave and so forth. Uh, I think the German uh, revolution is a very good example of that where you had council communists engaged in this mentioned this yesterday. Uh, I think that um, the Italian examples uh, are extremely instructive. Um, 
where they created a new movement that still exists today called COBAs. Um, I think we can learn a lot from uh, you know many different examples around the world. Uh, I think you're asking a question that most of us are trying to find an answer to. Um, I think in Czechoslovakia, uh, during the revolution, there potentially could have been the 1968 revolution, uh, a, a, a case where workers uh, and the working class uh, would be able to develop true workers' councils uh, because there weren't competing industries. Uh, and um, that's a, a, you know, a hypothetical case, but many people believe that that could have been a successful example of socialism when you don't have competition with other firms. You had one electric company, one producer of uh, steel, one healthcare, you know, and so forth and so on. There wasn't competition, and, and that in some ways uh, created the basis. But these are, as Elaine said, we have to learn from experience and we have to understand the processes. And I don't think that we're going to have a one-size-fits-all. Uh, we're we're going to need to understand the specifics that lead up to various struggles, and what are the consequences of them. And, and those specifics should be documented. Um, but I most, I clearly believe that we need to uh, see the next step as an example where workers actually occupy a, a factory that's being closed down. It creates uh, you know, the basis for keeping it at least maybe, uh, the basis for them to control it within a capitalist economy. In Venezuela, you have examples of that. You know, warts and all, there are examples of workers who did not occupy this, the, the, the government actually uh, encouraged them to uh, take over their factories and created a different union system. And that was uh, easier. I know a lot of people might say that's not a great example because it comes from a uh, country that's not a socialist country. And I, I you know, I, I think at, at least they try, and at least the president of that country is trying to create a different environment. That's a longer story. Go ahead. I have an example of, uh, of occupation, actually. I think it's ongoing. Uh, it was actually, I, I read about it a couple, days ago, a couple days ago, and it's still ongoing. The uh, Senza occupation in Dublin, Ireland, where there's a situation where uh, women, uh, there's, it's a women's clothing store, and uh, all the workers are women. Um, and I think they got fired or dismissed or laid off, or, what, or, you know, they lost their jobs in any case. And it was done in a unju very unjust manner. And the response to that was to occupy the store. And I believe it's still ongoing, although that was a couple days ago since I've looked into it last, so it could have changed. Um, I'd also like to address the question of occupied workers' control very quickly. Um, I think we're beating around the bush to what, what, the, what, what really needs to sort of uh, be formed here to sort of make that jump from occupation, temporary occupation or workers' control for a temporary uh, time and place, their, their workplace, to a more permanent, uh, a more, a more permanent uh, revolution, I suppose, I, I use the term. Um, what we really need for the next step is political organization, and political organization of the working class in the form of a party is the way I would, I would uh, sort of formulate that. Um, the, the way the CWI, the Socialist Alternative, my organization, sort of puts that into a slogan is that uh, Wall Street has two parties and we need one of our own. Uh, working people need to be organized in a political way and engage with the bourgeois parties on the political battlefield, even if it's their political battlefield. Uh, play by their rules and, and their game, and even break those when you can with strikes and occupations and whatnot. Uh, to the point where you can get organized and um, completely supplant the sort of the capitalist governments that we have and bring about a socialist system. That would be the, the sort of revolutionary change that I think a lot of us would like to see, though um, we might have different ideas of how to get there. And I, I, I'm putting this one uh, out there as, a, uh, as an example. There's a lot of things to talk about here and a lot of things we touched on. So. Um, uh, I could talk for an hour about a lot of things that have been said, uh, but I'll try and keep it short and uh, leave you with those, uh, those examples. I think one of the problems we're running into is that a lot of organizing is organizing against. I think what the young brother was talking about is there's also another side which is organizing for. And one of the reasons that we talk about you know, these experiments is that sometimes they start off as something against, but then they hold up the possibility of what could be. And uh, um, you asked me about Verizon. I mean, one of the things in the phone industry is that life has gone on. 
And back when it was still mostly landline, you could take over a facility and control the industry. Now, of course, it's all wireless. But people, you know, people forget that there is a thing, there is an aspect of capital that they forget, is that ultimately it's not just ephemeral, it actually has to put its foot down. And anywhere it puts its foot down, it can be dealt with. And that's what we need to think of. So for instance, right now, uh, I'm working with a group called the International Transport Workers Federation, which is a global union. <coughs> and guess what they're interested in? The logistics industry. Because why? Because capitalism today is about moving things. And, you know, and that's a crucial point. If you look at uh, what happened recently in China, in Guangzhou, with the Honda workers, uh, these are young women, overwhelmingly workers, in an assembly plant in Honda, in Guangzhou, uh, who basically uh, uh, went on strike, which of course is not quite legal in China, and they're not really, you know, they're in a, a union, but not one that represents them. And they just went on strike. And they not only shut down their plan, but you know, Honda's production throughout China and then Honda's, you know, sales, etc. Just within a few days because of just in time production. So all of a sudden, factories that used to be far less vulnerable are in fact more vulnerable. And those are the sorts of things that we need to think about. Organizing for also means you've got to have a program. A program is a, a, a political uh, uh, action. And, and it, it means you, know, you do need a party, and it does need to represent you. There is, of course, a problem that we have had a lot of experiments with labor-based political parties. And one of the major issues, certainly of my colleagues in Europe and in Canada and other places, is, you know, what do you do when you have one and it seems to not go your way? How do we deal with, you know, there's a crisis in socialist, social democrat, and uh, uh, labor parties, which is, I'm sure we can have a long discussion on that one. The last point I would make, and then I'll sit down and shut up, is I did say that the arrow of time moves in one direction, and this gets back to that point that I feel really strongly about why small experiments. Uh, you're arrogant if you say it's not going to work because you don't know. Let me tell you, my mother understood this as uh, the famous nursery tale. For the want of a nail, a shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, a horse was lost. For the want of a horse, a rider was lost. For the want of a rider, a battle was lost. For the want of a battle, a kingdom was lost all for the sake of a nail. What we're talking about here is mostly the nails. And the one thing you know is uh, you don't know which one is the one that's going to result in the shoe falling off, the horse not being there, the rider not being there, and the collapse. You don't know. In the same way, you know, as I said, you wouldn't know when people first decided to, you know, for a thousand protests in America, somebody sits in on Wall Street and all of a sudden it takes off like wildfire throughout the country and in fact internationally. Who knew? Uh, the one thing you can know is if you don't do it, it won't happen. Somebody's got to do it. And so a lot of these small experiments are in fact about trying to do it on issues as big as, you know, a, a, a labor party or a, a really, a, a, I've argued that issue here in the U.S. for many, many years. And you hear people say, well, you know, you don't understand. Listen, the American political system has gone through major transformation in its party system uh, at different points in history. There was a period where there was not. Uh, you know, when the country was founded, there weren't parties. Then parties came about. First party was the Democratic Party. We may forget that the Democratic Party was the slavers' party. It was the party of slavery. It was the party uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of a whole lot of reactionary things. The Republican Party was the party of Lincoln. What the hell happened? Uh, you know, they seem to have switched positions a little. Now they're both slaver parties. Uh, wage slave. Uh, so, you know, 
Uh, again, we've tried to create labor parties in America. They weren't successful. Who's to say now with so many people very uh, worried and, and totally you know, not uh, uh, pleased with the political system that the time wouldn't be right now. So it's, uh, uh, I very rarely discourage folks who are brave and prepared to take something. Uh, I often say, boy, you're braver than me, uh, good luck. But I very rarely say don't do it because in my experience is that, you know, we need more people who are prepared to do it and less people who are prepared to say, well, you know, the time, because every great revolution has started with a majority of people saying, the time's not right, you're going to lose, uh, it's, uh, you don't know what you're talking about, you haven't, they're so big, we're so small and insignificant. They always started that way, but somehow we captured the imagination, we won folks over, and that's how transformation takes place. In Tunisia, you had one person that uh, set himself on fire and that created, uh, you know, it created the basis for people to think about things that were going on in the country. I'll amend that. Don't set yourself on fire. <laughs> no, that's why I, that's why I did something. <laughs> I would agree. Unless you're... Oh, sorry, I thought the sister back there, we were, you had your hand up. Yeah, I don't have a question. Um, the question I wanted to throw out to um, Dr. Uh, thinking about the Occupy movement, um, like it's so different from you know what people are describing in terms of like labor organizing and workplace organizing. It's such a broad movement, and it's not based you know on a specific workplace, like in any specific, anything specific really. And so I was wondering, like I don't know, I guess like what lessons um, to take kind of like from the labor organizing to Occupy, or, like how, what the relationship could be between Occupy and Labor, kind of like what the next steps are. Um, I was also wondering, um, like Elaine, you were saying that um, movements oftentimes like start out conservative um, and then like become more radical. And I was wondering um, if you could talk about, because we were talking about like some like anti-sexist work, because we were talking about like anti-racist work in the uh, Chrysler Auto I was wondering like uh, if people could talk about like how kind of that process of like uh, like consciousness changing specifically around oppression, I guess. Um, I think that's like a big question in the Occupy movement right now. Um, yeah, yeah. And then uh, to say one thing around, I guess, like what you what you were just touching on, um, Elaine, in terms of like struggles and um, like you know, like whether to do it or whether not to do it, or like whether it's a success or whether it's a failure. Like I, I really, really agree that I think it's like. Uh, when we struggle, it's always a success. Like I think, like thinking about Wisconsin and what happened um, there last spring, or even thinking about the Occupy movement and like Occupy Boston, it's like, it's like, what does Occupy Boston accomplish? Like in terms of like legis like in terms of legislative stuff, you know, it's something material that we can say this is what we accomplished. There's nothing that was really done. Like like the encampment has been destroyed and smashed by the police, but it's like. Actually, you know, Occupy Boston has completely transformed the political environment in Boston and mobilized like whole communities to now, um, you know, be taking action on like a number of campuses, like Occupy Mosel Barrio, Occupy JP, like a whole number of activists who come out of, out of the woodwork um, and start like working on concrete things in the city. So, like, I really agree that you know all of these small struggles are part of building the left, and, and whether like right now we have immediate victories. They're part of like a larger project. It's always you know, a positive contribution to that larger project. One, one comment I would make is that there is a difference between a movement and an institution or organization. I mean, we call the labor movement a labor movement, but it's a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, it was at different points and is at different points a movement, but for the most part, it's a labor institution, labor organization. It's, uh, if you think about the Occupy movement, it's definitely a movement. I mean, you can't join it. You won't give us a card. Damn, you know. Uh, you know, you can't get a card. You can't pay annual dues. You can't, you know. And in, the, in a sense, it's still very ephemeral. It's, it's uh, belief. It's organizing. It's the way unions were when unions first developed. 
You don't start a union by, you know, uh, if you've got an outside entity, like a union that already exists and that wants to go and meet with workers and assist them, but you still got, at that point, even an institution. But when workers themselves, with nobody else, just start to talk about, well, you know, this is awful, let's do something about it, et cetera, et cetera. They're forming a union, and that's a movement. That's a movement. And then once the movement is, uh, uh, starts to consolidate and starts to have a formal membership, uh, you know, there's not a formal membership of Occupy uh, in, in the sense of, well, you know, what are you doing here? You know, you're not a member of Occupy. It's a, y'all come. Uh, and, you know, you chip in, you're a part of it. That's, that's a movement. That's a movement uh, practice. One of the things you've got to recognize with movements is they're not sustainable. They're not sustainable. That's why you move from movement to a party, to organization, to institution. Uh, uh, the great joy of movements is they, come, they seem to come out of nowhere. Uh, but, you know, in the same way they go up very, very quickly, they also come down. Uh, what the Occupy movement has done is it's done something that, alas, a lot of other folks wish they had done, which is that it has been very successful in uh, raising the issue of inequality in America and, in fact, in its first shot, pointing the finger very directly at Wall Street and big capital. I probably different than some people because I, I wish that they had kept that focus a little bit more. But instead it sort of spawned down into much wider stuff and you know, let's occupy Harvard, occupy Boston, occupy. And so then it becomes, you know, what are we arguing about here? Let's get back to uh, the problems we have in growing inequality in this country and the 99% versus the 1% is that the politics of this country and the owners of the means of production are this 1% and they seem to be running the rest of us 99%. Now there's a lot of issues to discuss. What does that mean and how do we come to some sort of agreement as what needs to be done, etc. That's why movements often are, are very, very messy uh, and why they end up sometimes you know, spawning a number of different organizations. Uh, uh, but how do you, how do you, what's the next step? Well, the next step really will be multiple steps. It will be some folks will decide that this has really galvanized them to start talking more about inequality. And they may choose to go in a number of different directions, whether it's, you know, uh, they decide that they want to work with unions and, and start to, you know, uh, uh, help organize folks to fight for more equality or uh, worker rights. Some might go into also.